Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Bhagam Radian here at the Air Force Association's annual Air Space Cyber Conference and Trade Show, the number one gathering of U.S. Air Force leaders from around the world, uh, converging here at the Gaylord uh, Convention Center just outside Washington, D.C. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Harris and Leonardo DRS, and we're here at the Spirit Aero Systems uh, stand to talk to Duane Hawkins, who is the president uh, uh, of uh, Defense, uh, as well as Fabrication Divisions, which I have to say, Duane, is one of the cooler titles here. Thank you, I, I love the title too. It's brand new, so. Um, and uh, anybody who knows you guys knows that you're integral uh, to um, virtually every single major defense program, whether it's the B-21, or whether it's commercial jetliners, or whether it's the new uh, MH-53 uh, helicopter, the K model, uh, that Sikorsky has developed for the United States Marine Corps. Um, you guys are on a very, very ambitious growth plan to uh, not only grow your commercial business, but to grow the defense side of the business, which is about 5% of about $8 billion in sales that you guys have, to 50% of the company in the future. First, walk us through the number of programs you guys are on, where you stand on all of this, because you guys are extremely busy even before we get to something like 737s, which you're cranking out at the at, at a rate of 52 uh, a month, even though you know Boeing has slowed delivery as it works through the problems on that program. Yeah, so we uh, so let me start with the B-21. We're one of the uh, seven major suppliers on the B-21 program. Uh, you know, we can't talk specifically what we're doing, but that's going very well for us. We're very excited. We've made some nice investments in that. And let me just say that's on schedule. And I think that, you know, in our uh, in our mind, uh, that's gone really well. And it's been a good example of what a commercial company can do, taking commercial technology, commercial uh, manufacturing practices, and just a different approach uh, to a defense uh, program in the development cycle. And so that's just one example. The other one is the CH-53K. Uh, we're moving uh, down the LRIP cycle with that. Uh, we're just getting ready to bid our, our next lot on that. And uh, that's that's going well. We're, we're, uh, we're getting ready to probably transfer that to a different uh, facility within our company so we can get more synergy out of, uh, out of uh, you know, our operation process like we normally do on commercial programs. And so that's, it's going really well. We're looking at getting some maybe uh, some additional work on that program uh, from our customer, Lockheed Martin Sikorsky. Uh, so that's that's the next big one. The B-280, we're just working with Bell, trying to help them develop that and, and get that uh, as a major playing field. Uh, I think everybody knows we designed the fuselage. Actually, we've designed every program, all the parts on every program that I just mentioned to you. And But we're, we've helped them design that in 23 months, which is much, much faster. Uh, than you normally see in a defense cycle for something that complex. So we're just, we're working with them right now and supporting them uh, to move that program along. And, uh, and uh, Bell uh, also uh, sponsors our uh, weekly podcast, our Washington Roundtable, as well as our, uh, our business podcast. Um, Talk to us about growth. I mean, where you guys are going to find it, how you guys are going to tap it. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a good environment now because there are a lot of programs and there's a lot of spending. Uh, a lot of this is on the kind of programs you guys like, which are you know big programs that have um, you know to justify the large expense and investment you guys have to make on it. But ultimately, how do you grow that number from five percent to fifty percent? Well, <clears throat> first of all, it won't all be through organic growth, uh, but. Uh, a large part of it will be through our organic growth, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the other part will be through acquisitions. So we're constantly looking at, at companies that might make sense, but might make a fit, a fit with us. Doesn't have to be a straight acquisition. Could be a, a joint venture. Should, could be some other kind of business venture that makes sense for us. So part of it will be through that. It won't all be through growth. But where we think our, our opportunities are, maybe in the area of hypersonics, uh, clearly supporting uh, uh, Lockheed and Northrop and um, uh, Raytheon in particular on some uh, new new programs, new platforms that they're developing. And so we've got a lot of interest from them. We're constantly uh, meeting with them, uh, showing them our uh, capability and, uh, and actually doing some work for them on a smaller scale to, to help them uh, where maybe some other suppliers aren't performing too well for them. So that's part of our, that's kind of the platform of what we're, uh, what we're uh, pursuing. But we, you know, we think joining in with the uh, local communities and with uh, some of our uh, political leaders that are very supportive, uh, we think we've got a great opportunity to grow our business uh, in Wichita and other parts uh, of the country wherever we're, where we're at now or wherever we're expanding to in defense. 
Um, do you, are you guys, uh, are, you, are you suggesting also that you guys want to go into uh, smaller aerostructures structures like, for example, missiles and things like that where you guys historically haven't had a footprint where your footprint has really been in the, in the bigger aerostructures, structures, the fuselages and things like that? You guys are ready to step down into that lower scale and still kick some butt? Yes, we are. As a matter of fact, myself and two or three other people that are uh, on my team, uh, we're all old missile people from the defense industry. And so we, uh, we, uh, we like that space. We think that space works well. It's uh, exotic materials, high temperature materials, uh, things that you know, make sense to us, the volumes that are similar to what we see in the commercial side of the business. So yeah, we think we have a great play there and I think, I think the primes think that too. And so we're, we've been spending a lot of time talking about the missile business and it's exciting. And, and hypersonics is just part of that, but there's a lot of other things that are happening in the missile world that we think we can uh, be a big part of that. So yes, that, that would be a big part of our business growth. And um, as you look at that missile work, how does that tie in? Do you think that that investment then in turn is also going to help you uh, improve your game on the bigger air structures in terms of uh, materials and processes on that smaller scale that, that can be scaled up? I, I think they complement each other. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think I think we can do both. We're you know we're doing both right now. We're a big part of CH-53K and the B-21, but I, th I think on the, uh, on the volume side of the missiles, uh, I think that's where we play really well because we, we know how to get into production really fast and, uh, you know, because the commercial world drives that and to do that the most economical way and make the investments, automate where it makes sense to automate, um, I think that's what is exciting to us about some of the some of the smaller parts of the uh, business, not the non-platform parts of the business. Um, when you look at manufacturing change, um, the, the entire manufacturing change is undergoing a revolution, whether through materials, through uh, greater robotization, uh, new processes. Um, you guys live in a part of the market where you're under an enormous amount of cost pressure from the primes to deliver what are big, very complicated and integral structures. Um, and, uh, you know, how is technology changing how you produce, and how are you, you know, what are the most novel techniques and ideas about where this game is going to be, say, in five to 10 years, given how much change we're seeing uh, across the manufacturing sector? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a big question. I think, in, in our mind, things like 3D printing uh, are, are going to become a big part of the business. Clearly, getting to near net shape or net shape as fast as you can with a, with a product from design to, to actual uh, implementation in the product. I think that's, uh, those kind of processes are the ones that are gonna make the difference. So there could, at some point in the future where you would skip out or miss a lot of processes uh, that we go through now traditionally because some of the new technology that's out there on our material is making that difference. We're investing a lot of money in that. We're a lot, I've been here six and a half years and just in the six years I've been here, our investment in new technology and new materials and automation is significantly higher than it was uh, when I got here. And so we see the future there. We're teaming with the people that we think are the right guys to team with. Uh, we're right next to NIAR, which is a great facility there in Wichita that um, has a lot of support uh, nationwide and a lot of our a lot of our customers, prospective customers use them. So. We team with them and do a lot of uh, material development there, just a few miles up the road. We have over 60 of our engineers up there working with them, and then we can transfer that back immediately to productionization, you know, integration into our products. So it's a, it's a nice it's a nice uh, vehicle, and we think Spirit's uniquely situated because of our relationship, particularly with NIAR. Um, I uh, asked a similar question to uh, Tom Gentile uh, last year when we uh, interviewed him at the Reagan Forum, and I, I want to ask you uh, sort of a very similar question. The Pentagon is increasingly interested in mobilization. You know, what happens, for example, in a great power confrontation, and how can we surge sources of supply? Um, very few people can build complex air structures at a rate and pace that you guys can, uh, as demonstrated, right, as, as I mentioned, 52 a month on 737s, uh, those fuselages are 70% complete. They, they go to Boeing uh, at the Renton facility and, and they become airplanes at the rate now of 42, so you are stockpiling uh, them just, just, like, uh, just like they are. But talk to us about how different supply chains are today from what they were in World War II. I think there's a sense that 
you know, if we were in a great power competition, we could convert factories and start pumping out defense goods, but it's a little bit more challenging right now, and I know you've had some of these conversations with folks in the department. What's, what, what does the department have to know about modern global supply chains? Uh, and, you know, the, the ability of companies like yours to deliver what they want on that future ambition and how much investment is needed for you to stand up some capability and hold it in reserve, for example, should it be needed in some future conflict. I mean, it seems to me it's a lot more complicated a question than just sort of saying like, hey, well, we're just going to unchain you guys and you know, we can get to the point where we're building a bomber a day. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> so that, that is. I, I know it's a little bit of a big question, but I wanted to get your take on it. Yeah, that is a challenging question for sure. Um, well, I think first of all, in terms of supply chain, uh, just in, in my career, the supply chains become much more global, particularly on the commercial side. So that's just something to think about when we're mobilizing that a lot of our supply chain is global now, and that's because of the business market we're in, which is a, which is a great thing. And, uh, and predicated on just-in-time delivery for most of those articles. Exactly, yeah. So it's, it is, so there isn't, there isn't a huge amount of uh, capacity, and there really shouldn't be a huge amount of capacity, particularly on the, her the commercial market, because that's, that's just additional costs you don't want in a very competitive environment. But uh, having said all that, I think on the defense side, um, you know, what, uh, what we can do now is we're much quicker at utilizing, uh, taking existing uh, uh, factories, existing buildings that are maybe empty, maybe did something else, and converting them over to either commercial or defense opportunities really fast. And so that's one thing we do at Spirit. We, we're able to take a building and we're able to make that uh, uh, operable in just a few months, whereas I think in the past it took, it took years, so you can do that very quickly. The other thing is automation doesn't take as long anymore as it used to. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great automation out there right there on the, on the floor, uh, right there on the shelf. You can go get, do a little bit of, little bit of modification and pro reprogramming and uh, you, know, you, can, you can get into the business. That's why you're seeing a lot of smaller guys starting to get into the business, in my opinion, particularly in the machine shop business. It's the machines are so good now, they're so accurate, and they're so diversified that that uh, a lot of people can get into that. So I think, I think the equipment that we need uh, is being built quicker and faster and better and does more than it used to before. It's a lot more accurate, and so therefore you don't maybe need as much as we used to 20 or 30 years ago just because of the nature of the technology change. And so that's how we approach it. And uh, you know, having to having to make changeovers on the commercial side helps us a lot on the defense side. So having to move from one product to another doesn't really scare us too much. It's 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 kind of what we do, you know. And and um, we just have to react to the market. Um, let me ask you a workforce question. Um, you know, the kind of skill sets you guys need, even though there are fewer bodies in the factories because of that greater level of automation, you need different, more educated, more highly trained people in your workforce. How are you developing workforce? Where are you getting it? Do you have enough of a supply of people because we're at a almost near record low unemployment uh, phase right now. Uh, there are some debates about some of the underlying figures uh, and the like, but this trend has been ongoing for the last many years. Uh, you know, not anything recent. Um, you know, how are you getting that supply? Or, you know, do you have excess, or do you, are you finding the right people to be able to grow the business the way that you want to grow? Um, yes, we are, but it is clearly it's a tight job market. I think any, any, anybody in, in any business would, would say that, particularly in the manufacturing side. What we're doing is we're teaming with the local uh, community uh, colleges and um, high schools, which is kind of going back to what we used to do about 25 or 30 years ago and doing more vocational training. So getting the kids early on and getting them interested in manufacturing, um, not, um, you know, th those that might want to go a different route to get their college degree. Uh, they may not go directly from high school and go get their college degree, but they might go to a two-year training uh, school, and we hire them, and then we can support them when they want to go on and get a bachelor's degree or something more than that. And that's, that's, uh, that, that's kind of uh, way, waved away just a little bit in the last 10, 15 years. And we're, we're very big supporters of this. So that's one thing we're doing. We're, we're, we're taking these, uh, I call them kids, but 
these uh, young men and women who are, who are uh, uh, either just out of high school or are getting out of high school, and we're uh, working with the, the community training centers to, to train them uh, to, to work on our kinds of products. And not just in our area, but in the Wichita area proper. Um, and uh, one last question, uh, and I know my uh, co-conspirators on the weekly uh, podcast, business podcast, will chide me. Uh, Ron Epstein, uh, Dr. Rocket Ron Epstein of Bank of America Merrill Lynch, who's on the program, uh, as well as Sash Tuza of Agency Partners and Richard Abalafia of the Teal Group Consultancy uh, are on every week. I think names familiar. Know all of them. You know all of them. Uh, they all, by the way, say hello. Uh, Rate. I know you're not Boeing, but you guys are going to stay at 52 for 737 Max uh, fuselages at, at this point. I mean, uh, and 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 where where are some of them going? Yeah, uh, that's right. I mean, you really do have to talk to Boeing about that. But we will stay at 52 as long as uh, as long as uh, we're asked to, and as long as we can stay at 52. Uh, what we're doing is uh, any of the uh, uh, surplus ones, if you will, we're we're wrapping them and. And, uh, and, uh, and kind of a package to protect them from hail and the elements. And we're moving them across the street uh, real close to McConnell Air Force Base and storing them there. And then we kind of rotate them around, uh, you know, every few days. And uh, we'll be doing that, you know, until, uh, until things change. But, uh, but so far it's going really good. Um, you know, the, uh, we're taking this time to uh, get our, uh, improve our quality even more, uh, drive more cost out do all those things that uh, maybe we wouldn't have been able to do had we been continuous on this 10% rate increase every year. You know, now that we've got a little bit of a, a lull in the system, we're trying to take advantage of that and just make it as efficient as we possibly can. And then make that future surge even easier. Yes, that's right. Exactly right. Yeah, you know, everything will be will be smoother. We're, we're putting some automation in in some cases that we just didn't see that window back when it looked like we were going to have these huge year-over-year uh, uh, -year increases. So, yes, it'll, it should help us in all those areas, making improvements wherever we can. Dwayne, thanks very much, sir. Dwayne Hawkins, the president of defense at Spirit Aero Systems and also Fabrications Division. I, 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 divisions, I absolutely love that. Dwayne, thanks very much. Best of luck to you guys. Thank you. Thank you.